exploits to exploit the Unicode problem on that web server. And remember what I told you? It's essentially they just tidied up versions of the exploit that you ran through the browser. It's exactly the same thing. Did anybody have any difficulty with them, with Uniscan or Uniexe? Did You'll notice that when you run the Uniscan tools, it cycles through a number of different directories and a number of different uh, variations of the SQL encoding. Uh, that's because we're searching a directory that's executable, and we're looking at different ways of encoding those um, strings in, in the hope of finding a server that's vulnerable. And with time, uh, we have a database of strings that work in different configurations. Um, and that's basically what it does. So it's just sort of brute forcing through different options. Um, I don't know. Are there any questions on, on that? Everyone have you able to create a directory? Um, now, the directories that you've created, I want to ask you, as we move forward now, we're going to be hacking into SQL, uh, into SQL and into Microsoft servers a lot. I want to ask you that when we do do that, whenever you put files down anywhere, that you create a directory for yourself and use that directory. I don't really care much where it is. But um, I would like you to try and use that directory if you can. It's just keeps it just keep, keeps you out of each other's hair. Um, then for the next prac, uh, it's necessary that that user directory was created in um, CINET pub scripts. So if you, if you didn't manage to do that, don't you just ask Cameron to give you a hand so that everyone does have a directory? Because um, you're going to be working from it. Yeah, so and, and that and your directory must be in your machine username. Because what's gonna happen is the all the class underscore scripts, they read your name off your workstation and they kind of force you to go to certain places. Um, and, and that's why the directory needs to map like that. Okay, so no problems with Uniscan or UniXE. Okay, the, the EXE is just a pull to EXE version of the written for Windows. The results from the Unicase scanner, getting a directory listing in C root, finding the file password.txt, everyone get that? No difficulties. Um, it, was just, it was just a, there was a password. Oh, no, no, we put the file there as an example. It doesn't have any real meaning. Um, I think the trickier stuff comes when we get to the MS Query 32 stuff. Did anybody get stuck there with firing up, creating your DSN and firing up MS Query 32? Right? Nobody got stuck. And you understand the difference, you understand the rule of the DSM, uh, which defines the connection to the, folks, the correct drive. For that. Um, and then the query analyzer, which uses the ODBC connection to connect the single analyzer to talk to various databases. And so ODBC forms a kind of a middleware layer between your analyzer. So were we connecting, had we been connecting to an Oracle server or a Sybase server, EB2 or whatever the case may be, uh, we would just get with a different kind of driver and so we'd be able to talk to any of them in the same way. Um, and SQL is fundamentally the same, so your queries would look the same way. Now, um, SQL SA password is blank because uh, Typhon told us that in the previous exercise. I and I then get confronted with this complex looking thing. I couldn't tell you exactly what all of them do, and I don't think you really need to, to know. I, I would approach to this by, by looking through it for something that looks interesting, and I would Probably, if this had been a real life scenario, explore every one of them and try and understand their nature. And if I figure out what it was, I might Google for it. But eventually, you would figure that these are all pretty much system tables. And as you go through this and you look at all of them, way down here, eventually, you see this users table. Now, this users table differs from the rest, it sort of stands out. Um, 
And it differs from the rest because this is a user-created table. It's not a SQL system table. It doesn't store SQL usernames and databases. In this particular instance, this table stores um, usernames and passwords that are used by an application. So there's some, from what you have, oh, you, you don't know this, you mean the background. There's some application that is asking users to log in. And it's checking their username and password against the data stored in this table on the SQL server. All right. So when you log into that application, which I'll show you in a little while, two, two, two sets of authentication are happening. The application is logging into the SQL server as SA or as something else and running a query to pull your username and password from this table. And then it's comparing the username and password that you try to log in with against the username and password that's stored here. That's what this table is, is being used for. And so now I've run a query against that database. Different kinds of exploits. Um, we said that's primary and secondary. It may be that I've now found my primary information. Maybe that I find a credit cards table in here. Or, or um, whatever. There's tons and tons of things that get stored in these kinds of databases. At the office in the men's room, uh, we allow the guys to stick up screenshots from really nice hacks that they've pulled. And most of the guys have got like a little war cry. Like um, Harun always says, I'm amazed by the simplicity of it all. And uh, Rudolf always says, another day, another hack. And he's got things like that. And then they sort of put up screenshots that are really nice. And what we've got is of a database where they store the username, the password, and then the password prompt. You know, have you forgotten your password? And then you, you put a question and an answer. <laughs> Look at the questions and the answers that people give. And that's just typically hilarious. So I won't go into <laughs> what they are. Most of them are rude. Um, so, so that may be the data that you want. The, you know, um, could be that's what you're looking for. Um, smaller modern banking systems, for example, are often run off this kind of database. So uh, a, a small country, you want to start a small bank service, maybe uh, a few hundred thousand customers, and you want to do it all electronically. You can now go to companies like Phoenix here in the States and say, I want to buy a bank. And you buy the entire system. And the bank is run on a database like this. So you get into the SQL database, it's all there. Like all the transactions, the transaction logs, is there. But in this case, we're looking for a bit more. We're looking for control over the server. Now, if we go and have a look over here, what you're seeing there is the actual is the syntax of the actual SQL query by your SQL analyzer to the SQL server via ODBC. Here they're executing a select, uh, what do we call it, a select statement or a select. They're selecting uh, two columns from the table users, which is located in the master database. I could rewrite that sort of in my Pinton SQL by saying, um, select star from master And I get much the same thing. I could take it a step further and say, to master dot dot users that and if I go back here and get 
Let's start from again. Yeah, I've added a user. If I can do select from, I can do insert, I can do drop, um, I can do create tables, I can do a whole lot of data related things, right? Um, and because I'm SI, I can probably create new databases, I can probably do a degree of user administration, I can do a whole lot of stuff. And one of the things that I can do on Microsoft SQL, and on the majority, in one form or another, on the majority of other um, SQL server uh, database server applications, is I can do something called an exec. What an exec is going to do is it's going to evoke what we call a stored procedure, which is really a function stored somewhere in the database, somewhere in one of the default databases, which the SQL server can execute on my behalf. All right, so now I'm moving beyond just running queries against the data itself. I'm actually asking the SQL server to do something active. And typically the sorts of things you do is create new users, enumerate users, enumerate the databases, uh, maybe establish a connection to another database, but they take it further also. Uh, with SQL, you can ask SQL to send emails or other forms of notification. You can ask SQL to map drives. Um, and there's a list of dozens and dozens of, um, of, of stored procedures and what they call extended stored procedures, which, which you can then ask SQL to run using this exec command. And, oh, thanks, man. And by far the most interesting of them for, and on SQL, something called xpcm underscore cmd shell which is an extended stored procedure which evokes a co Windows command interpreter. All right, and then you can pass it, you can pass that function as a parameter, any DOS command, and it'll run it. I can... Oh, sorry, let's give the location, master, and then in brackets and in quotes, I'm going to say C. I don't know, the brackets are wrong. And you don't need to back here on the side. It's always executing a command and returning the output of the command to me as opposed to a query against the database. And now I'm running with the privilege of the SQL service on this machine, which by default is system, as opposed to with the Unicode exploits where my privileges were uh, those of I use a computer name. Okay, and this is really where um, SA uh, SQL access becomes dangerous. Now, not all database implementations will have XP command shell, but most of them have something like that, or, or at least some forms of uh, stored procedures which allow me to do stuff that uh, that's interesting. So, um, the advanced for this for this exercise. So. Um, a what we call the DNS tunnel to list the files in a given directory. Now the background to that is this. What I've shown you here is how we can connect directly via TCP to the SQL server, log in, and run a command. Often I'm not able to log directly into the server, but I am able to ask it to run commands for me. Um, an example of that is where a web application connects via ODBC to a SQL server. And most of you will be familiar with that architecture. You have a DMZ located somewhere in the DMZ is a web server, which has some kind of interactive application. It allows you to log in, or it allows you to run queries, or it allows you to do interactive stuff. And it's getting that data from a server. And typically, or very often, it gets it from something like this, like a SQL server. Now that SQL server could be located on the machine itself, on the same server where the web server sits, or it could be located somewhere else, either in the DMZ or an e-commerce network or somewhere in the private network, you could have a server running this data, depending on the nature of it, I guess. So now what's going to happen is you send a query, you log into the web server, for example, the web server, using your PHP or whatever the case may be, builds a query and submits that query to the SQL server. Right, so you don't connect to the SQL server directly, the web server connects. And uh, using various forms of attacks, which we'll discuss in a minute, I may be able to inject query into the query being sent from the web server to the SQL server. You're also following me. So what that means is it may happen, de depending on a thousand different factors, it may happen that I can influence the query being sent by the web server 
to the SQL Server and get it to do something like this, which is great. Problem is, I don't see this output. I have no interactivity. This is not even not being executed on the web server. It's being executed all the way back on the SQL Server. The a way of seeing whether that stuff works or not. So what I do is I try and prod the SQL Server into sending me some indication that the command that I've injected um, is actually working, right? And I do that by doing an NS lookup. Recognize, and I direct it at a web server that I control, uh, a Unix server that I control, 192.168.252. Frickin' man. I'm sorry? See, I thought there was a problem with that. Thank you. And then what I'm going to do is on a Unix server somewhere that I control, I'm going to use TCP dump, which is a simple packet sniffer. I'm going to say There's a little sniffer running there. I'm going to execute this command. And over here, you see the query through. All right, so what I've done is I've used SQL to force the, the SQL server to execute a command. I told it to do an NS lookup using my IP address as a server. And on my IP address, I see that query coming in. And so I know that my command is executed. Now, in this particular instance, I know that anyway because I can see the output. But remember, I'm, I'm sort of trying to prepare you for a scenario where perhaps you can get the server to run the command but not see the output directly. Okay? There's no guarantee that 53 is going to come to me, but I've got a fairly good chance that it will. Compared to with all other network protocols, it's probably my best chance. And I don't have to specify the IP address of the server where the lookup is to be done. I could, for example, change my query to read this. And because I manage the DNS server responsible for the sensepost.net domain, I can run my sniff on that server. And that DNS packet will then request packet will find its way to me. Is this making sense? I'm seeing some blank space. Um, I can direct the output to a specific server, the way I did in the first example, right, then I don't have to be running a DNS server at all. The disadvantage there is that I'm requesting the SQL server to send a UDP packet straight out, which the firewall may not allow it to do. Using the second method, right, by tagging something to the end of a domain that I control, even if the SQL server can't send packets straight out, it's going to send the request to its primary, to its DNS resolver. That's going to send it to its DNS resolver. That's going to send it eventually all the way to my, um, to my name server that I control. In that case, I do have to have a registered name server. You guys still with me? So, so even if the machine can't talk directly out, eventually that UDP packet, that DNS request is going to find its way. And I see it coming through over here. So I know that the SQL server executed the command. And I can now extend that. All the stuff that we played with yesterday. So over here. This is just for practice. I can say four. Percentage. I don't have too much time in it. Um, use back. Uh, in. Jersey. Slash. Dot. 
post block. Practice, and there you go. No, that's not right. Now you see that for every file in the C drive, this is now my local machine, right? I'm not hacking anything yet, I'm just testing it. For every file in the root of the C drive, my machine is sending out two UDP packets requesting the DNS name associated with that file. Okay? So I stick it at the command and for each line, as it comes out, my machine's doing an NF lookup saying, hey, what, what is this associated with? And it's doing it twice because um, it didn't work the first time. So I don't need it to fill, it's just sending the data out. And so I'm using UDP packets to tunnel the output of the command out. Now I'm going to just change one. That's one. It's this little piece of code which I just built over here. I'm going to lower it so you guys can see now the difficulties I have. Hmm? No, no, no. Sorry. It's a nice idea, but no. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace this whole command here all the way up to there with that. Sense post.net. And with a little bit of luck, voila. So you see the bit to the left of the .sensepost.net is the other file maps, documents, .net pub, etc. And with a little bit of hacking, sorry, because the first request fails, so it sends out a second request. I could probably set it with an NS lookup flag. I haven't even looked. Um, now with a little bit of hacking, with like orc strip hacking on this side, I can parse the files out. And with uh, an amazing amount of for loop and command line hacking, you can get your commands out to such a degree that you can have a fully interactive prompt. We took control of a primary domain controller within a bank from the internet once using this technique, where we never saw the output of our command. IP config, add user, change password. Um, remember that the quality of the output is relatively unimportant um, as, as far as interactivity is gone. I want to be able to send the command, which I can do very effectively. And I want to have some indication that the command is working. And I want to be able to get my data out. So I do an IP config, and it sort of comes out a little bit broken like this. That's OK. I can pull the data out. Do a net stat, see what the routes are, enumerate the users. All of that can work. And most of the DOS commands will allow me some degree of control over the formatting. Right? So I can, for, like this, the slash b slash x that I did when I did the dir, that tells me to drop the, tells dir to drop the headers. It doesn't say, directory of blah, 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 date, blah, blah, blah. It just gives the files. And the slash x tells it to send it out in 8.3 format. So I don't get file names with spaces in them. And so I ensure that all my files come through in a way that I can easily read them. Okay, so with a combination of those two things, I can get it. And all of this going proxied via UDP out. Okay, regardless of how far buried the server is inside the private network, regardless of what its actual IP address is, etc., etc. I'm learning something that is significantly more difficult. It's, uh, it's just as important. We can talk about that um, in a little while. But as far as uploading things in, there's no single golden rule. There are a lot of different things you can try depending on the scenario. One thing you can do with SQL is you can write a SQL query which uses an open row source command to literally make another connection to another server. So I can run one query which tells this SQL server to make a connection to my SQL server and copy across a table and then run another query that tells it to take that table and write it to the file system. Um, so you can do that sort of thing, for example. But that's all going to depend on what the specific configuration is. We'll play with that kind of thinking in a minute. All right, it's advanced. Um, 
to you now because I want you to, um, you're going to see the value of it in a little while. Okay, so again, in this particular context where I have a direct connection to SQL Server, doing this doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense. But uh, in a minute, I'm going to show you a scenario where you don't have a direct connection to the SQL Server, but you're still able to execute SQL queries, and then this sort of thing does make a lot more sense. Yes? But say you can only get that data out over and over and over. Yeah. Let's say the only way you can get it out is by a practice. Yeah. What, but this is a <laughs> spot question. Um, I don't really want to spend too much time on now. We're going to be spending quite a lot of time on it in a little while. Um, and the answer is I don't know, and it, it's going to vary. Um, on the back of this guide, in fact, to answer your question, look on the back of the guide. There's a case study, uh, which in fact addresses exactly that question. It's a question where we're executing commands on a SQL server, which is buried deep inside the network, um, and we're not able to communicate with it directly. And what we did then is we basically set up a series of map drives and move the data closer and closer to the perimeter of the network by mapping drives out and eventually wrote it to a web route where we could access it. Um, and it took, I don't know, it took weeks. It took weeks and weeks to do. Uh, it was very different, you're working blind. Um, but so there, there are various ways and it's, it's, by the time you get to this point where you're executing commands and now you want to start building your channel and stuff, uh, we say it's like trying to fix a car through the exhaust pipe. So you, you've got your hand in there and you're like, yeah, I think this is the carburetor. Um, let me just pull this here and see if the engine goes faster, and then it doesn't. So you're like, okay, that wasn't the carburetor. That must be something else. And then you're like, okay, this is the alternator. I can recognize it. So if I can pull this out here and plug it in over the up, I dropped it. And now you're stuck. And it's like, okay, now I have to go and find it again. And you go all the way down here. It's, it's exactly like that. Um, so unfortunately, I can't tell you any quick answers. Look at the case. It'll give you an idea of one of the things that we could e-commerce.com. Yeah. All right. But I, we need to run because we've got a lot of interesting and important things to cover. Everyone's still feeling fresh. Did I put my speaker on? Right. So what we did was um, we went through fingerprinting. And in the last section, I spoke about uh, what I called identifying vulnerabilities. I said these are vulnerabilities which exist on a machine. They've been previously discovered and documented by someone. And our job is to try and figure out if they're there. And then what we did in the last practice, I just gave an example of how we would exploit some of those vulnerabilities. And we looked at um, two in particular. We looked at. Um, the exporting the Unicode vulnerability using your browser and using the Unicode exec. But exploiting the fact that the guy's got a blank SA password, right? Two fundamentally different kinds of weaknesses exploited and fundamentally different kinds of ways, giving us different levels of privilege. What I want to do now is I want to touch on vulnerabilities that are not previously known or documented. All right? Now, if you want to go into finding vulnerabilities in uh, Windows binaries, for example, you visit Halvers class or Greg Hoagland's class. What I'm talking about here is a, a class of vulnerabilities we call the back security vulnerability. So we're looking at faults in customized web applications. They can be customized. They can be commercial web applications. Who, who would like to comment on why we're interested in finding vulnerabilities in commercial um, web applications? Sorry? Exa exactly. Well, sorry, I actually misphrased my question. I, I said commercial. I'm not interested only in commercial, but in web applications in general. Why would I be interested in finding vulnerabilities specifically in web applications? Exactly. There's two very, very compelling reasons, as uh, Microsoft would put it. Um, there, there's so many of them, and they're directly accessible. At, w at the gateway to, to anyone's network these days, the primary point of access is a web server. It's a web application, right? So it's by far the most prevalent um, application on the internet. And, um, and because it's interactive, because it has, you have this whole thing between the web server and the database server, it gives us a fair chance of getting into the, into the private network. Am I making sense? I've really mangled my words badly. Do you understand what I'm saying? Basically, there's a lot of them. All right? And they're internet facing. And very often, they give us access to the private network because the web application is interacting with data on the inside. Now, I'm not talking about web servers. I'm talking about applications running on web servers that offer us some form of interactivity. Give me examples. Shopping sites. E-shopping sites. E sites. What else? Extra. Yeah, extra, lights, extra net sites. What else? Big one. 
internet banking sites, right? Internet banking. It's a big web application. Oh, this is all very secure. <laughs> I'm <wrong there. laughs> um, Internet banking application. I'll give you a statistic. I can't give you names. But I've worked in the last year on five major internet banking applications, all of them. And not because we're particularly clever. Standard kind of stuff that I'm going to teach you now. Um, and the reason that these things are so insecure is because there's a, there's a thinking gap between web application developers and hackers in this space at the moment. Hackers are wearing a completely different hat when they look at these things. Um, and they're running way, way ahead of the application developers. The application developers are still trying to solve other kinds of problems. So um, whereas Microsoft over the last two, three, four, five years drilled and hammered and hammered and hammered about security, uh, these web application guys haven't been. No one's giving them a hard time yet, uh, firstly. Secondly, most of these guys are um, locally seated. They're, they're locally positioned. They're, they're not, we're not talking about big companies like Microsoft developing web applications. We're talking about the bank's own developers, this e-commerce shop's own developers, this mom and pop store own developers. Right, um, the companies used to be, they used to be web design companies that used to do these you know, graphics and stuff. They're like, oh yeah, we'll bring in a guy who knows a bit of HTML, oh, we'll bring in a guy who knows a bit of ActiveX or Flash, we'll bring in a guy who knows a bit of this, he surfs around, reads a couple of books, he's like, oh wait, hang on, look, I can give this a login page, suddenly, oh, look, we can do this. And the next thing you know, he's building an interactive site, um, and he's raised the security profile of the thing massively, because now this connection is going to databases sitting on the inside of the private network. Um, but it's still the same guy. Right, he started off his career writing um, JavaScript. Like, oh, look at this pop-up. All right. So there's a big skills deficit um, at the moment with web applications. So a very, very interesting space to look at. And the final reason why they're interesting is because they're fundamentally challenges with web applications that are very, very hard to solve. And the biggest of those challenges is what we call state tracking. Right, when you log in to FTP, Telnet, SSH, pop three, any of those things. You make a single TCP connection, you authenticate, and as long as your connection is established, you remain authenticated, right? The minute your connection breaks, you're no longer authenticated, you have to log in again. TCP is keeping state for you. Now imagine a web application. You make a connection to the web server, you pull down the page. Log in, you connect, you disconnect. All right? Now you, sub you pull out the form, username, password, you submit it. It gets posted, connect, disconnect. All right, you're like, okay, now I want to surf to this part of the site. I click on the link, connect, disconnect. There's dozens, hundreds of connections going in and out the whole time. Da, 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 da. And doing all of this, as you're browsing around, you're buying fluffy, um, you're buying fluffy slippers, pink fluffy slippers from an e-commerce site. And you're like, okay, log in to my e-commerce site, give them my details, lick my profile, blah, blah, blah. You go to their bedwear category, you select footwear, slippers, pink, fluffy, size four. As you're moving around this, um, application the whole time. This web application somehow has to keep track of who you are, right? Who is this guy that, that we're dealing with? Text it's new connections. Where he is in the application, and, and what he is allowed, what he selected in the past, right? So he's already in this category. He's already told us he wants his prices in dollars. He's already told us he's got this discount voucher, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what he's allowed and not allowed to do. Same with internet banking. It's massively complex applications handling multiple connections all the time. So state tracking is a major challenge. And the guys make mistakes. And as hackers, we want to try and identify and exploit those mistakes. Sorts of things that we could look for. This is all going to sound like Greek now, but in a little while, you'll start to understand it. Sort of thing you can look for is what we call directory traversal. I showed you a form of directory traversal with the Unicode thing. It works like this. You, there's a... Um, a URL, that, a URL that allows you to download a file. So you surf to the CGI, show file, it has a question mark, reflecting that there's going to be parameters, and the first parameter is cool is F, and it takes a file name. So what happens is, this CGI is going to fetch that file somewhere from the file server, format it perhaps in a certain way, and send it to you. That's what the CGI does. What we do is we take the file name, we replace this file name with the directory traversal, and the file and the, and the name of the etc shadow file and I get the CGI to go and fetch the etc shadow file from the etc directory and pass it to me. Right, what's the mistake that the programmer made? He's not checking for directory traversal. Right, he's not doing proper input validation. If Microsoft can do that in the IIS team, 
uh, it doesn't surprise me that this guy doesn't do it. Right? He didn't know. Um, and maybe he's smart enough. He says, oh, wait, hang on. We'll check for dot, dot, slash. So what I do, I union code my, my uh, request. He didn't know to check for that. Why well, hex encode it? All right? He didn't know to check for that. That's an example of directory traversal. Command execution. Um, I submit a, uh, think an example. Who is? Remember who, uh, Geek Tools and who is the... Yeah? What are these guys actually doing? They're taking the name of the DNS domain that I want to look at, and they're passing it as a parameter to some program that does the who is lookup, right? In fact, we've got a copy of the Geek Tools one. It's called proxy.pl. And, and literally what they do is they take the DNS name and they pass it to, to pull dot slash proxy dot pl and they take the output name to, to you. That's all they do. So I, at the end of my domain name, an ampersand or a pipe or a, or a, or a um, semicolon or something that's understood by the particular operating system um, that they're running on and I use it to change chain my commands one behind the other. You're understanding this, right? So, um, so what happens is they take sensepost.com, semicolon, ls, for example. And the command that they end up executing is pull uh, proxy.pl sensepost.com, semicolon, ls. And they pipe that all back to me. And so I get them to execute commands on my behalf. Again, an input validation problem. Um, SQL insertion, I'm going to talk about in, a, in, a, in depth in a second. And essentially what we do there is we're trying to manipulate the query that's created by the website and sent to the database in such a way that we can get the database to do something that it wasn't designed to do. And finally, state problems. The, um, like we said, the server has to keep track not only of who you are, but of where you are in the application and of what you're allowed to do. And it's a massive undertaking for a developer. And because every page on a website is a distinct application, right? It's viewaccount.asp, transferfunds.asp, login.asp, logout.asp. Every one of those is a different application. So even if he does it right, in 99% of his pages, he may be doing it wrong in just one. Right? So the poor guy, the odds are really against it. Let's have a look at one. This is a state, state tracking problem. Uh, this is an application that we wrote. It's an automated scanner. And what it does is every day it runs a set of scans and it reports the results in a table like this. And then you can see yeah, uh, you know, sort of how serious those results were. And um, if you want to view any of these reports, you can click, for example, here on the view link, and it'll then take you to the details of this report. Now, to get to this point in the page, in the application, I first had to log in. I gave my username and password. The username and password were validated against data that database. And at that point, the application generates a session ID, which is a very long um, 32 bytes random number and it passes it back to me in the form of the URL. So tagged onto the end of every URL that I can click on is the session ID and you see it over here. See the long number over here? Here's a slightly truncated version of it. A truncated version of it. So any one of these URLs that I click on is going to look like this. It directs me to the actual CGI that I'm calling. It passes it the tracking number, this thing over here. And over here it passes it the report ID that I want to view. So by clicking on there, I'm saying, I want to view the report. This is the session ID that you assigned me when I logged in. And this is the report that I want to see. Okay? And the web server is then going to evoke that CGI and hopefully show me the results of the report. Now, think about it from the programmer's point of view. When you click on that, he has to do a number of security checks. What's the first most obvious check that he has to do? He has to check that the session ID is valid. So stored somewhere in the database, He's got this session ID um, associated with my account and maybe associated with some time. So like you've been logged in since and you've only got an hour before I time you out. So the first thing he's going to do is he's going to say, OK, uh, is, this guy, is this a valid session ID? All right, it is. It's in the database. And is it still valid based on the time? Yes, it is. But he has to do with something else. Who can tell me what that is? He has to check whether the report that I'm wishing to view legitimately belongs to the user who's associated with that session ID. OK, because otherwise, how would I attack this application? Yeah, I log in as a valid user. I look at all these reports. I see, oh, I've got uh, 958. And over here, I've got uh, 
994, and over here I've got 1023. And obviously what's happening is as this machine is generating reports, it's assigning them a new report ID, right, sequentially. And I can see that because there's gaps in mine. So I'm thinking, well, between my 958 and my 9, um, 982, there's a whole lot of reports that probably belong to somebody else. So I copy this URL out, I paste it into the task bar, my, my address bar, and I replace the 958 with the 884, whatever. And what do you know? The system checks, are you authenticated? Yes. And it pulls somebody else's report out of the database and shows it to me. Very, very common mistake. It's a, web, it's a state tracking authentication problem, not an authentication authorization problem. And you see this thing happening in internet banking a lot, for example. I log in, and then I access somebody else's account by manipulating either the URL or the, um, the value of the data in the cookie or the hidden form fields that the developer is using to keep state of the application. I know this is complex. If you haven't looked at CGI's, it's hard. But in a while, you'll see it actually in action, and then it'll make a bit more sense. This is one uh, someone here was telling me about that they told you about in the Foundstone course. Again, it's a simplified version of an e-commerce application. Bear in mind, what's happened here is um, you've gone through this entire bank process. Blah, blah, selecting categories, colors, sizes, numbers, whatever. And eventually you get to this point where you say, OK, I'm going to buy this book. And you're going to fill in the number and the name of the book. And the system has collected out of its database the price of what that book is going to cost you. Right? So once you've entered the number and the name, you're going to say submit. And what this thing is typically going to do is it's going to take those values along with the price, which it previously pulled out of the database, right? and it's going to submit it to a CGI, which typically is going to then forward it to some kind of e-commerce gateway, some sort of transaction program. There's lots of service providers that do that. They're going to deduct the money from your They'll send a, a, a success code back to the application. The application will say, your transaction has been processed and forwarded on to shipping, right? So I look at the source of this, and I see that here's the Here's the, um, the number. The value that I put in there is going to go get stored with this variable. The name is not in here. And the price that they previously collected is stored in this variable over here, total price. Okay, So during a previous phase of this application, they did the math and they figured out how much I'm going to have to pay. Right? And they store that value here in this hidden field within the application. So what I do is I take this page. I view the source. I save it locally to my machine, right, onto my disk. Then I go and I edit this. I take this $500 here out, and I replace it with $5. Okay, and then I pop like 100 in there and the name of the book that I want. And I say submit. And what happens, I end up posting to the CGI that it should process 500 copies of my favorite um, you know, bird watching magazine for only a total of $5. It's a very simplified example, but it happens all the time. Do you understand? And what's, what mistake is the developer making here? He's using me and my browser as a repository for his state data. right? Because he previously determined how much I'm supposed to pay during a previous part of the application. And I was like, OK, he has to pay 500. How am I going to remember that? Um, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll write it into a hidden field in the form so that when he submits, I can just pull it out of the form again. And he's depending on me to safely store that data. And I don't have to. I save it to my machine. I manipulate it using a number of different techniques. And I send it back to him. And he's made the mistake of trusting the client. Right, how much that? Exactly. He should have some form of scratch pad that he saves in the database. Or do the query, or do the query again. But in this case, it's simple. But there may be other stuff. There may be, for example, you know, more complex information, the characteristics, the properties of the thing that you want to buy. Isn't ASP uh, supposed to solve all this? Because ASP has a state variable. We can stick anything in it. And yeah. It just uses a cookie to look it up. T to a degree, um, yeah, it sort of does, but not really. There's still other similar issues, depending on the complexity of the, of the application. And, and you'll see an example of some of them a little bit later also. I haven't yet, no. No. And, oh, you, you have? Yeah. You're exactly there. Yeah. In this hotel? No. Oh, no in another hotel. Okay. Arun um, <laughs> sent me this mail the other day. It is a famous car dealership we're working for. They're a big model car that, that you would all know. Some of you probably drive them. Uses a middleman for secure payments. Exactly the kind of scenario 
that, uh, that we were talking about. He says you choose an item. The item and the price is sent to the gateway to handle the payment stuff. One, what happens if we change the price before submitting the gateway? The last count, he had three t-shirts, two beanies, those are those little hats, and a jacket for a total of 98 cents. In the end, these guys caught us out uh, in account. And they wrote us a very nice letter saying they appear to have shipped us, shipped us, shipped us three shirts of B2 beanies and a jacket for only 90 cents. Big clerical error. <laughs> Would we mind either returning the goods or paying the difference? Um, but the, the system did it. And it happens all the time. This sort of thing happens all the time. How do we find these kinds of errors in applications? How do we go about finding them? Sorry? Um, yeah, the HTML source. Maybe you don't see the source code ever. No, no, it's the HTML source. It, it's essentially a question of elbow grease. It's essentially a question of surfing and surfing and surfing and surfing and asking all those questions that I was telling you about previously. Who are these guys? How do they work? How do they fit technology? How do they know who I am at this point? What happens if I do this? What happens if I do this? And error forcing. Error forcing, error forcing. Error. Make it break, see how it behaves. We'll see examples of that in a minute too. Another one, you've all seen this. Now you have to concentrate because it's really tricky. You've all seen this, right? Login and password. Typically, what the guy is doing at the back end of this page, in his ASP source or in his PHP source, he's got a SQL query that's built like this. He creates a res result variable, which is, which is a, a SQL query, right? And the SQL query says select from the users table. Remember the database that we saw? All the users where the card number equals whatever is there and the PIN number equals whatever is there. Now remember our table that we saw? This is how he's thinking is going to work. He's going to say, I'll build this query, right? I insert the card number and the PIN that the user gave me and I send the query to the database. The database runs through the table looking for any records that match. Right? If it finds a record that match, matches, it returns the PIN. And if I get a record returned by the database, I know that it found a matching user, right? In other words, I know that this user is valid. And in, in a, a number of us, particularly ASP applications, the logic the guy applies is, if I send this query and I get a reply, then I know that the user is valid and I therefore log him in. He, okay? He checks if there's at least one record in the... He checks to see if there's at least one record. And his, and his logic is sound. Were you to enter a correct card number and an incorrect PIN, the database would return no records. Were you to re in insert a correct PIN but an incorrect card number, the database would return no records. And if both were incorrect, the database would return no records. In other words, if I get a record, it must be a matching combination, right? Flawless logic. So we do this. That goes there. That goes in there. So in that field, I insert something that looks a little bit like that as a username. In that field, I insert a bit of crud. Now watch what the effect is of that on my database, on my query. My query now says select all the records from the user table where the card number equals X or where 1 equals 1. And I tag on the end this minus minus. And what this minus minus is, it's for SQL a comment, meaning that everything to the right of it gets ignored in the SQL query. So in essence, that there falls away. Now logically, my query says, give me back all the records where either the card number equals x, which is never going to be true, or where 1 equals 1, which is always going to be true. Always. Regardless of the content of that record, that query is always going to be true. So how many records does the database return to? All of them. If my logic said, well, if I get more than 0, then it must be valid, then in this example, I'm now a valid user. Let me show you the exact code that looks like that. So next star from users where the username equals and you see these red single quotes over here? Uh, these are single quotes that the, that the developer is injecting to encapsulate the variable. All right? So if we insert a value in there, his total query now looks like that. See, this single quote comes from there, and this single quote comes from there. It's important. The single quotes thing is important. So I inject into the first field something like test, nicely encapsulated within single quotes. Into the second field, I inject my own single quote. Why? Because I need to terminate his. If I don't do that, I'm going to get an error message, right? My SQL will be unsound. So I inject a single quote to terminate his. I add my all 1 equals 1. 
and now it's a training single code at the back which is going to break my query but I get rid of it by injecting the two comments so this single code falls away and it doesn't bother anything I've got a sound clear um, SQL statement which now reads like this select star from the users table where the username equals test and the password equals x or where 1 equals 1 which is always going to be true and in this case the thing is going to return all the records now we can try that and, and this we didn't make up this we literally copied <laughs> no ASP well enough right 10, 15, 10, 100 remember when we did the NICTO scans against this machine we found an admin directory you guys remember that we said slash admin and I said no now It's really good, a bit faster than this. Are we up, Emma? Is it dead? Let's check down in the right place. Oh, there we go. All right, it looks like that. Um, let me show you this once, and you get a chance to. You're going to get a chance to try it out in a second, right? Looks like that. So, if I, for example, go over here, test, test. Uh, that was the data, that was the password that I just injected into the password I just injected into the database there a little while ago. Right? This is the same database. But now I can't get here anymore, I don't think. Because if I'm right, the firewall should now be blocking it, right? So I no longer have direct access to that SQL server. But this application is logging in as SA to that SQL server. I can't see the SQL Server myself anymore. So let's forget test, test. It's going to be the admin, admin. So it's me access denied. So I tell it test. And I say x, single quote, space, or 1 equals 1. Throw in the minus, minus, and it drops me in. All right, using exactly that kind of problem. Now, how do I find something like this on a site? Well, typically what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to force an error, right? So I'm going to do something like, let me just show you this quickly. I'm going to do something like this. Oh, that's not right. Something like this. And I'm going to make sure I've got this and this and this and some of these and a whole lot of stuff like that. We call this fuzzing. Bam, my application breaks. Why? Because the tr program is not properly trapping in input, which is fundamentally the problem with this thing. And what I'm getting here is I'm getting the raw error back from I'm getting the raw error back from from the SQL server. Right? And from this error I can learn a lot. I can learn that they're running Microsoft SQL, and I can learn that they're running ODBC, and I can learn that the programmer is A not properly trapping input not properly sanitizing input right and I can learn that B is not properly sanitizing output okay so I can try something else and in this case I'm just going to put a single quote in. this breaks again it says unclosed quotation mark before the character string single quote where does that come from it comes from this application where I've injected a single quote and I'm left with something like this this trailing single quote, that's what I've done. So he's now got three single quotes somewhere in his query, and it's breaking. All right, and that tells me that this thing is susceptible to this kind of problem. OK. Now, um, the x or 1 equals 1 thing, it's not, it's this very simple example of this. All right, this is very, and you're going to think it's so simple, it's got to be pat. It's not pat, it really happens, it's real life. I was telling some guys that. Um, in a course I was once teaching in Belgium, <laughs> one of the guys did it on his company in the back corner while I was talking. It's like, oh, try this. One equals one, bam, and he got in. Because this code is published and distributed as an example of how to handle this problem. What's the problem? Well, you've got a web application. You want to log your users in. You're writing with ASP. You've got a SQL backend. This is how you do it. And that's where we got it from. So it's not that uncommon. 
But it may be that the particular server that we're attacking is not this simple. So we want some tools that are going to help us to do this error forcing and um, analysis of the thing a little easier without having to blindly type um, into this fork down here where I can't see. And for example, if I only put two characters in here, Broken again. Yeah, it's supposed to be like a five letter thing here, Hammer. That's not this version of it. Uh, the point I actually wanted to make is that sometimes the web applications still have JavaScript in front of them too. So you enter a too long password or a too short password, it'll pop up a JavaScript saying, oh, your password is too long or your password is too short. That's not the server checking you. That's the web page itself checking you long before the data ever gets to the server. And that stuff's going to get in my way when I want to do this sort of thing. Right, so we're going to apply basically two major kinds of tools. The first kind of tool we're going to use is what we call a fuzzer. What a fuzzer is going to do is it's going to crawl using a number of different techniques, crawl the website and try and identify any um, active components. So parameters passed in a URL um, or fields in a form. A number of tools that do it with various degrees of, uh, of success or failure. We've got one called MiliX, um, which uses kind of a semi-automated semi approach to identify all the fields. And then what it does is it builds a string which looks something like that one at the bottom, and it just hits every form and every field. Every field and every form hits it. Da, 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 looking for any response that could be construed as an error, including like a 500 server error code, the code error, and you can program them usually to... Um, you know, to what to look for. That's the one kind of tool we're going to let we use. I'm not going to use those tools in this class. The other kind of tool we use is what web proxy. What the proxy is going to do is it's going to sit between your browser and the server, and it's going to record everything that goes up and down so that you can analyze later exactly what you sent and what you got back, and so that you can intercept and modify exactly what was sent and what came back. One very good one of those is something called the at stake web proxy which I'm going to fire over here. Now this is the freeware version. It runs as a little Java applet on my machine. Okay, and it's now created a listen socket on my machine on port 5111. I then take my browser and I configure it to surf via 5111 on my local host. All right, now all my requests are going to be via the little Java application. I can then open up another browser and I can surf to the keyword web proxy. And it gives me the interface. All right, so this is a little administrative interface for this tool. And I'm surfing over here. So let's now go back. I'm here now, right? And I'm going to say test-1 and test-2, so I can identify the variables later and submit them. All right? I now go to my web proxy. And you see over here, I've got a thing called the request editor. The request editor keeps a record of all the submissions that I made. And here you can see it recorded that I submitted to login. I click on that. You can see the exact makeup of the submission. the IP address, the method that I use, the ASP, the HTTP, the ASP session ID, which you refer to. Um, the ASP session ID. Um, and here are the two values. I posted the field username. I posted test1. With password, I posted um, test2. And I can resubmit this request now at any time just by hitting enter. Now it's just reposted that page and showing me the output. Or I can go back and say, well, I'm going to replace this with a single quote. And now I can see the single quote, right? And this time I get the error. Or I can go back and say single quote or 1 equals 1 minus minus. You can see what I'm doing now, kind of. And I broke it. I haven't. Alrighty. You're understanding the, what is the fundamental error that the programmer is making? He's not validating his input. It's called input validation. Right. That's fundamentally the problem. Yeah. Is he shouldn't be allowing me to put a semicolon or a minus minus into my password field. 
doesn't belong there. All right. Um, and solving, finding and solving these things is really not that trivial for a programmer. Okay. Um, I want to take this one step further before we. The, or two steps further. Yeah, one step further before we try it ourselves. The first thing I want you to understand very carefully is what I'm doing here is, is I'm fundamentally modifying the query being sent from the web server to the SQL server. Right? So I'm actually doing a very ugly form of SQL pro Okay, And the better I can understand the nature of the query that he's sending using error forcing, and the better, uh, and depending on the structure of, of his query, um, I can do just about anything using this that I could do using pure SQL from a SQL analyzer. So for example, I could over here add an order by the first field. Right, so I'm telling it to sort the query. And that didn't help me much, but let's order by the first field descending. And suddenly I'm another user. Right, because now it's returning data in the other direction, and I'm now not logged in as the first user anymore. I'm now logged in as the last user. All right. Or I could say something like this. Um, where 1 equals 1 and username equals test. Oops. Right. So I can, I can really, as, once I start to understand the query, I can sort of do with it pretty much what I want. And because SQL has this common thing, it's really nice because everything to the right of me, I just log away. I don't have to worry about it. Other um, databases which don't have that force me to write my syntax in such a way that I literally plug in to the existing query and incorporate whatever's to the right of where I'm injecting. SQL, I just throw what's to the right away because I've got comments. Very nice. And if I can do this, what stops me from doing this? Let me ask you this. Is my query breaking? No. The, the query is working. All right, let's break the query. Damn, it's not going to break either. Hang on. Let's break the query by, for example, taking one of these out. Bam. The query breaks. That's what would happen if the query was breaking. My query is not breaking. My query is going through. The problem is, this command that I'm asking to be executed, what's happening is physically, on the SQL service, it'll very, very very closely. It's a little DOS pop. DOS box pop up, the door would run and the docs box would close. There's no, there's no communication of that back, back to the web server somehow so they can automatically appear on my, on my page. And remember I was carrying on about the DNS tunnels earlier? That's where the DNS tunnel thing becomes here because I need some way for the SQL server to tell me that this command was executed. So I don't do a dir here. I replace my dir with an NS lookup. Control owns you at sensepost.net, not at. I guess I thought I was inventing DNS, right? And I'm going to go here, I'm going to use this little tricking. And I don't know what the DNS, what the IP address is of the server anymore. So I'm going to drop this away. Now you're going to see all the new, uh, DNS queries coming in. I throw that. And there you go. 
All right. So now I've forced my SQL server to tell me basically that the command is successfully e executed. If I have no direct comms with it, and using the same techniques that we used earlier, I can now start to do IP configs and do a listing net users and add users and whatever. And essentially, any command that I execute is going through the firewall to the web server, being sent from the web server through the next firewall all the way to the SQL server, being executed with the system privileges right in the middle of their private network, all of it using legitimate tra traffic. Assuming that the user that the database that logs the user that the application logged into the database with has the privileges. Um, now there's a lot that guys can do to stop this. Apart from just cleaning up the coding, um, the SQL lockdown stuff, it's determining the privileges of the SQL user, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you want to learn that stuff, SQLsecurity.com. And the next, they're they're the guys to read. They're very very excellent. I don't get something uh, when you did the CMD shell. Uh, what what's actually doing? Turning it as a table. That's no. what it's doing. That's why. That's what we got from the SQL query to um, try to. Yes. It really returned it as a table. So why didn't it just show it instead of the username? Um, access granted. The uh, volume. Is mm. Well, try and try and imagine what your query looks like. I'm trying to imagine not what the query looks like, but what the application is doing. The application is building the query. It's sending the query to the server. It's not displaying the results. It's interpreting the results and reacting appropriately. The application is saying, if I get a table, if I get a result back, then I consider the user logged in and I show him this screen. If I don't get the right results back, I consider him fake and I show him that screen. There now are it's other. Not the, it's not coming from the database. It's coming from the. It's the application database. interpreting the results of the database. There are other applications where um, where they do show you the database. Okay, you might see it. Yeah, um, but in this particular case, no. Did you have a comment? Yeah, put a subs. You can put a add version of subs, something like that. You know, probably get something. Yeah, I reckon. I reckon. Yeah. Instead of the whole exec, just put in add version. Yeah, it's actually cool. No, uh, silly. Here's he called UVA. I'm not sure if I know if that was bad, but if it was select, you I think if you could write a query. I'll check it out now. I think you must substitute the user up to the boss and the user for if, if, if you could write a query that returned a result, and inserted the value of something else into the into the name field, then you would get a welcome and whatever that that name is. You could do that. The, 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 what you can do here is limited by how well you know SQL and how well you can understand that guy's database. Now, and how you understand it is by forcing different kinds of um, yeah, that might work. Um, as username. Whatever. Let's the field is called username. No, I don't want to get into it too much. Um, what I want you guys to do is to run with prac 12, which is essentially this.
it's not working. If you want to do a union select, Yeah, but if I um, from this right, from that, and I should I have yeah. being able to select star from users where username equals text and password equals dot dot or one union. Okay. Select Okay, well let me, let me take this out, like for example. Okay. By username and password. I think so, yeah. Let me try this. Instead of 4141, try some cross points. Doesn't return any results here? Right, so get rid of 4141. And burn as. Uh, version as username, yeah. comma at the version as password, I need that. Ha! There you go. So there I got SQL to pull its version and return it as one of the fields. So you can do that. So yeah, the yeah. But but I mean look how this look how this query looks now. It's, it gets pretty hairy pretty quickly. And the whole time what you have to do is you have to bear in mind what he's done all the way to the left of you so that you can keep the query actually um, actually working. And uh, it's might. I mean it's it's horrible. It's hard. But you see how I, mean, I have to return the value in there because there's only one field of output that's being displayed and that's username. Yeah. So if I can force the value into username then it'll work. That, that version is actually a small procedure but it's just you know, um, directly. Yeah. You have to execute. Uh, yeah, I understand. But the, the problem is yeah, um, sort of the application is the only thing the application is displaying of the query is the username. So now I could do this. Um, I don't know if you could, but you can now say, can you do a select exec? No. You can't. So select or an exec. Yeah. Or you're trying to get the directory called. Yeah, into the username. C can I say union um, exec as? Can you do an exec as? Master.xp cmd. I don't know SQL well enough to do all this neat stuff. Enter as user. He doesn't like me putting exec in there. 
right? I don't suppose you can do this. Use his name. Nah. So this other one is pretty neat. It's gone now. It's all gone. It's all gone. Access denied. Um, basically just do what I did now. Try it out. The internet? Uh, it might be down there. That was cool, I and mean, I liked that. Uh, you can put the at that connection. Connections, huh? Eh? Well, that's just a number of connections. I don't know that. Just playing with all the different attacks you can do. Adapt. Adapt. Ah. Adapt. 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 For those of you who have been watching this, you understand what the union does in this case? Basically takes the output of one query and tags it onto the bottom of the output of another query. So I'm essentially saying, yeah, so I'm essentially saying, um, return all the, the rows from his query and tag all the rows from my query on, on, onto the end. Yeah. And, um, and the trick there is that you have to have, in a union select, you have to have your query have to output the same number of columns as his, which is why I, I tag this extra one here so that I'm returning two columns. And again, it's just, it's just ugly stuff. So yeah. And just to put this into context, what we're busy with now is vulnerability exploitation. We discover these vulnerabilities, and now we're playing with different ways that we can um, that we can abuse them. Um, and sorry, just another comment uh, regarding the web proxy. You'll see there's two versions of the web proxy installed. Um, there's a 2.0, which is or 2.1, which is the newer one, and a 1.2, I think, which is the one that I've got. Um, 2.1 is better, but the, but the evaluation version that you've got is functionally limited, whereas the 1.2 one, you can do more stuff. So I actually should have mentioned it previously, but if, if I were you, I'd actually rather go for the 1.2. <laughs> so sorry about that. I, I just remembered, um, it's a, but it's a quick uninstall, reinstall kind of dohiki. You can maybe do it. For, for this exercise, you'll be OK. Um, but, but for later exercises, you may rather want the 1.2 one, which is fully functional. Um, for this exercise, it's fine to use 2.1. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, you don't have to spider this up. Oh, um, in this case, it's actually sort of a shade on the top of the, on the, top of the pack. You would just want to spread that one? For now, it's okay. There's, a, there's another... 
so it came out really badly. But yeah, the witch pocket. In fact, uh, there's another feature. I told you uh, earlier that uh, we have uh, what I call the semi-automated um, fuzzer, right? Um, so what a fuzzer does is that basically we're going to use it to brute force to all the fields, throw a whole lot of rubbish in there, and see if we get anything that looks like an error back. And those are then the fields that we're going to investigate. And it's important, like I said, because you just remember that a web application is really a, a whole set of discrete applications. Right? So they may have different coding standards. And we need to investigate every field on every form. And you can be talking about hundreds and hundreds of fields, complex applications. So I want to try and automate it as best as I can. What we do is we use the um, at stake file writer function, this function over here. And basically what file writer does is it logs my session. So I'll get in by hand and I'll surf through the entire site by hand. Um, just throwing in as much data as I can. I um, mean to every possible form I'll throw the data in. And this thing's gonna log it, log it, log it, log it, log it. And I'm done. Um, I submit that log to our MiliX tool. And MiliX is then gonna run through the log and say, okay, these are all the fields and then run its fuzzer against those fields and show you where it found stuff that's interesting. The why, who can tell me why do I take a semi-automated approach, approach as opposed to a completely automated approach? Um, yeah, so I can kind of tell what's going on. But because um, web applications usually have a logical flow that a fully automated tool isn't able to figure out. Right? It, a fully automated tool is just going to see a field and just throw everything into it. So the field asks you, um, please enter, uh, please enter your username and password. So it goes like five and X, and then the thing says, please enter your username and password. So it goes C and four, and it just keeps throwing at username and password. And actually, what you need to do is you need to get a valid username and password and log in, so you can see the rest of the application. Um, and so, fully automated tools that try and traverse or spider the application very seldom work because. Um, they're not able to understand the flow of the application. I'm talking sense. Eh? Yeah, I think the thing, basically the whole problem is the logging thing is that something is form based or based, you know, basic applications. So you need to tell the application to log in first and then only start browsing. Otherwise, it just takes the first page where you get the prompt and it's like, oh, I there's no problem here, it just popped up. Or it logs in, if, if, even if the, some of the tools where you can tell it to log in, give it the username pulse, it logs in. The second page then is the logout yeah. page. Logs out again, now it tries to do the rest. It's okay, well, there's no problem. It's because they don't check the pages. Yeah. Stuff like that. That's, wh that's why this sort of thing to date is really an automated way to check for it. Your scanners can't do it because they, they can't understand the nature of the application. Um, and of course, so far, we're, we're really looking at very simple technical errors. Um, but sometimes the errors that we deal with are much more complex logical errors. So to do with how the application thinks, rather than...